Right, so our final C, so we've uh, previously we've looked over chest pain, we've looked at Crohn's disease, and now we're going to go down celiac. Celiac disease. Uh, I think, James, there are very few chronic diseases that I know less about than celiac disease. I know a little bit about Crohn's because when I did general and acute medicine, sometimes they came in on my medical takes and I would fairly quickly shift them off to the gastroenterologist for specialist advice. But I have to say, I don't think I've ever seen a patient with celiac disease. So can you first of all tell me what is celiac disease? Well, let me push back, actually. I don't believe you. You may have seen a patient with celiac, but you may not have known it. So Crohn's disease affects probably 50 in 10,000. Celiac is one in 300. Really? Really. But it's such a spectrum. So, and we're seeing that more and more often now. So celiac disease is another autoimmune disease, but here the body is reacting to a specific antigen from outside. It's reacting to gluten, and that's in wheat, barley, oats, which is why, for a perfect example, someone you know, with celiac disease can't go and have normal pizzas, okay? Because they're putting this um, antigen into their body, which goes through the bowel wall, and then the body attacks that, damaging the bowel wall. And previously, we used to think that we had celiac disease at this end, that was it, all done and dusted. But now we know that, like so many diseases, it's spectral. So we've got celiac at one end, and we've got a gluten sensitivity at the other. And that's, you know, uh, in terms of gluten sensitivity, it's basically it's saying how much can you take before your system becomes overloaded. So for myself, again, knowing my sister has Crohn's, we're a bit of a bowely family. I do not have celiac disease. Broadly, eat whatever I want. However, if I go and have a very large pizza, I'll end up uncomfortable, bloated, and probably spending a while in the loo the following day. Because that's my tolerance limit for what my bowel can take in terms of gluten exposure. And if I use gluten-free food, which I don't very often, but if I did uh, for a short period of time, I have you know, a great bowel life but just occasionally eating too much will uh, set me off because I'm on the very bottom end of the scale there. Talking of bottoms, I wonder whether the viewers out there, James, would like to hear the details of your bowel habit. The problem is with doctors, we absolutely love poo. You come into the GP surgery, you know, it doesn't matter what's going on, very quickly, what's your bowel habit like? Is it, you know, are you going more often? How often do you go? What's the colour like? What's the form like? Something to Google, actually, we can probably put up a picture. Have you all seen a Bristol stool chart? I have. Have you seen the Bristol stool chart cake? No. <laughs> it's amazing what you can use as um, stand-ins for different forms of stool. Mars bars, Maltesers, curly whirlies. It's a very, very interesting cake, which most um, uh, gastroenterology wards will have seen at some point. So it sounds like I have seen over the years many people with celiac disease, but it was probably problem eight in their problem list, and I pretty much ignored it that day. Uh, but I guess what I meant to say is I've never diagnosed celiac disease. So what are the symptoms a patient would get if they had celiac disease? Well, like a lot of bowel issues, they can be very similar. Diarrhea, possibly constipation, but more likely diarrhea. Abdominal pain, feeling tired all the time, just being a bit off. And that a bit off can be one of the, a very common reason for people coming to uh, see me in GP land. The question is, why is that patient a little bit off? Now, we've talked previously about vitamin B12. With celiac disease, it damages this autoimmune reaction, damages the small intestine. And one of the things that we can't absorb well with it is vitamin B12. So it might transpire, I'm working up a patient for being tired all the time, and as part of that, I check their B12 levels, find they're low, I then need to do more work to find out why their levels are low. And one of the things that I'll do with any patient with low levels of B12 is do a tissue transglutaminase. Um, so looking for another marker in the blood. And if that's raised, job's done. We have our diagnosis. We know it's celiac. And we'll advise a patient to simply avoid gluten food. So it can be diagnosed on the basis of a blood test. You don't actually have to put a telescope in the bowel and biopsy the bowel, for example. That is the gold standard. So 
again, it's the small intestine that's affected, so we'd want to do an OGD, we'd want to do a gastroscope, gastroscope all the way through and get a small biopsy in a patient who we couldn't nail the diagnosis for whatever reason. And there we'd see changes to the structure of the small intestine. We'd actually see them looking like someone's gone at them with a sander. So the small intestine's got lots of little finger-like projections that allow things to be absorbed from the bowel. With, uh, with celiac disease, they all disappear, and we've got completely blunt of bowel instead, which is why they don't absorb the B12. Even if we were to give stacks and stacks in the mouth, it will go in and then out. But if we've got a positive test uh, in terms of the blood, we don't need to put that patient through the extra risk of having an OGD. So are patients with celiac disease tired because of B12 deficiency causing anemia? Is that the reason they're tired? They're also tired because it's an autoimmune disease. The body is inflamed. The body is attacking itself. And celiac disease can be in many ways considered to be a, a modern day disease. Now the reason why I say that is if you look at the production of flour over time, it's become more and more refined. It has very little relation to you know, the classic grinding of you know, oats on a wheel. Um, we've now got this sort of white powder stuff. Because it's so refined, it's more easy for it to get through the bowel wall. I think it's possible that flour has now become so refined, it's gone from being an antigen to a super antigen. So we're actually seeing more patients with celiac who we might be surprised at, which is why I say it's more of a, a spectrum. So now we've got patients who we will think that they've got celiac, we'll do the tests, but they come back negative. Then the question is, do we put them through the rigmarole of doing a camera test, or do we simply say, let's try to avoid some gluten-type foods and see how you do? Quite frequently, those patients come back and say, actually, that helped. Not perfect, you know, occasionally I want to go grab a biscuit, I have one or two and I'm fine, but if I have ten, you know, I've got a bit of an upset stomach the following day. So we've now got this grey area with it. But also, that test needs the antigen. So if I'm going to ask you to do a celiac uh, screen, I'm going to get you to eat loads and loads of bread because I need the system to be absolutely screaming so we can detect that. And often the tests have come back negative because a patient is avoiding all the things that will make the test go positive. Let's um, talk a bit more about what a patient can do for themselves. Is it simply a matter of going to Sainsbury's or any other supermarket and going to the gluten-free section and choosing your food from there, or is it more complicated than that? In terms of their standard uh, lifestyle, yes, pretty much. If you have a defined diagnosis of celiac disease and you're severe, you know, you, not the gluten sensitivity, then we want you to absolutely avoid that, uh, these foodstuffs. And as a result, on the NHS, you can actually have gluten-free food prescribed. We can provide you with you know, specific loaves of bread and things like that. Now, there is a debate as to whether or not, given the cost of um, uh, gluten-free food is reduced and is now much more available, whether or not that should continue on. But it is still a, uh, something that's available at the moment. I didn't know that. Uh, but being an autoimmune disease, presumably there are patients with a more severe form, and do they need steroids or something like the drugs we give in Crohn's disease, like we talked about earlier? No, I say if we stop the, um, the, the gluten, we stop the disease. Really? So quite simple. Mm -hmm. Now, this does link with some of the bits uh, with regard to Crohn's disease. We think that Crohn's, in terms of the autoimmune side of things, is affected by the gut microbiome. So if a patient is having a low fibre diet, so it's recommended that you have at least 25 grams of fibre in your diet a day, we know that if you're failing to get that amount of fibre in your diet, it increases your risk, anybody's risk, of getting Crohn's by 30%. Similarly, what we eat is hugely important to bowel health. And there we're seeing that with celiac. You're having this food that's causing problems, and I bet you a pound to a pinch of salt that is also going to be affecting the gut microbiome. But that's, that's you know, a new field of science that we're currently exploring. And people are beginning to talk about giving 
things like faecal transplants, taking faeces from well patients and putting those via the back passage into patients that are unwell with Crohn's, inflammatory bowel disease, other bowel-related issues like that, to try and replenish good bacteria in the bowel. I'm sure you've seen plenty of patients with C. diff in the hospitals who we can't get a handle on the treatment of. Yes, I have, and C. diff is a major problem in most hospitals, and intermittently we have outbreaks on our ward. Um, I think it's probably a subject for a discussion on another day, another C, C. diff. But my uh, point there was that we are using faecal transplants as a treatment to cause C. diff remission in patients that we've not been able to treat. I didn't know that. It's amazing what you can learn here, viewers, isn't it? Right, I think on that note, uh, we'll move on. Uh, it's been nice to see you all again and see you another time. Yeah. Thank you for watching, and if these have been useful for yourself, please consider giving the video a like and uh, click on the subscription button, because at the end of the day, we have to obey the algorithm. Thanks. Take care.